We all know vaccination. Yes. Uh, we have polio vaccination. We have uh, different types of vaccinations. The Imam today, if you listen to the khutbah, touched a lot on the question of riya, the question of pride. And I'm going to touch on something that is very important on this subject of pride. Because pride determines who is your creator, who is your Lord. Do you listen to yourself or do you listen to Allah? And so pride is a basic mechanism for moving from Allah and considering yourself greater. But there is another thing the Imam said in his Juma prayer, something that nearly let me just say, many scholars consider a prerequisite. A prerequisite to a khutbah is you should tell people to have taqwa. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu taqullah. That people should have taqwa. What is taqwa? Taqwa is God consciousness. Taqwa is that sense of Allah's presence that is strong enough to affect your behavior. Taqwa is not knowledge of Allah. Knowledge of Allah is useful for taqwa. Even shaitan has knowledge of Allah. But shaitan doesn't have taqwa. Knowing Aqidah is very good, is very important. But when Aqidah is ready to work in your behavior, now you have taqwa. Taqwa operates like an immune system. When you eat food or breathe and a germ enters you, we, they teach us in biology that we have an immune system. And so when a germ enters your system, your white blood cells capture and kill the germ. And so with all the dust and dirt we breathe and drink and our water and our food, Alhamdulillah, for most of the time, we are able to stay healthy. When you have a strong immune system, you are able to defend yourselves from germs. Taqwa builds our spiritual immune system such that when somebody gives you a bad suggestion, gives you an idea to do something that is not good, your taqwa quickly recognizes it as something wrong. And you have the power to deal with it. <coughs> One of the du'as the Imam read today, he said in one of the du'as, Allah, Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqa that Allah should show us the truth and recognize it as the truth. Warzikuna tiba'a. And may Allah give us the power, the ability to follow truth. But Allah also, we pray, wa arinal al We pray Allah to show us falsehood for what it is. Let us recognize falsehood. Warzikuna tiba'a. And may Allah give us the power and ability to move away from it. Taqwa is critical in our conscience, our fitra, being sensitive enough to see good and follow it and do it, to see bad and avoid it and prohibit it. We always are required as Muslims, and we read it again and again in the Quran, Illa amanu wa amilan salihan. But in the amilan salihan, we are required in the, when you say what is salih, what is good, or what is maslaha. In the maqasid of Sharia, it is jalbul masalih and darul mafasid. It is accruing of benefit and avoiding harm. It is amr bil ma'roof. Doing good, forbidding wrong. But we have one big problem in the Ummah today. And it becomes a serious problem when we don't know truth 
from falsehood. When people bring counterfeit money, when somebody brings 1,000 shillings, but it is fake, what does that do to your society? Somebody buys something for 10,000, you give him the goods, you collect the money. You go, you want to use it, and somebody says, no, I don't collect this money. Or they report it to the police. We have a big problem if, while we pray, Allahumma arin al haqqa haqqan, show us the truth for what it is. If you cannot know the difference between truth and falsehood, you are in trouble. If you don't know the difference between medicine and poison, you are in trouble. If you don't know the difference between the way of Allah and the way of Shaitan, you are in trouble. One of the requirements of a Muslim is to talab al-ilm, to seek knowledge. And the search for knowledge, the Prophet ﷺ said, is a faridatun, it's a fard. Ala kulli Muslim on every Muslim. Whether that knowledge is fardu ayn, like how to do your salat and prayer, or whether that knowledge is fardu kifaya, like providing security, providing food, keeping the society clean. And what destroys a community, the Prophet ﷺ said, is when the ulama starts to die. We already live in a community where we don't have enough ulama. Alhamdulillah for those who are around. But we hope there will be even better ulama. Because when ulama leave a community, if the people who are going to handle the field of medicine and doctors is a fardu kifaya. The ummah will go into darura if we do not have such people. If we don't have people working in security, the ummah will be, just say, all police go and retire. What will happen here over the next month? No more police. No more courts. The people who clean the rubbish, if you tell them all of you don't work for one month, Will anybody die? The people who clean the rubbish, the garbage. If they don't work for one month, will anybody die? Yes, diseases will start coming. Cholera will come back. Typhoid will come back. In fact, if the people who clean don't work for one month, the people who will die will be more than if an army came here. And so providing cleaners is a fard. Why? Because if you don't have them, society will go into the rura. So as Muslims, we must have people who clean, people who are medical doctors, people who are pharmacists, people who provide all the things required to prevent society from falling into the rura. That type of knowledge is a fard. Why? Because in the awaib, the scholars teach us, if something is fard or wajib, but you cannot do it without something else, that other thing also becomes wajib. If you cannot have doctors and businessmen and everything in the modern society without certain fields of knowledge, those fields of knowledge become wajib, they become fard. So some types of knowledge are fardu ayn, some are fardu kifaya. What is the problem we have today? It's not only our scholars are dying with age. We have Muslims who kill our scholars. We have Muslims who disqualify our scholars. Who undermine our scholars. Now let's leave the topic of Islam and go to the topic of medicine. 
What happens to a society if you kill doctors? The moment you are a doctor or you are a consultant doctor, a specialist, if we kill you, what happens to our society? We all know what happens. We will fall into the rural. What happens if somebody who is a good engineer, the moment they say you are a good engineer, go and kill that person, what will happen? You will construct bridges that will collapse on people. You will construct houses that will start to collapse. You will have roads that keep destroying and people start having accidents. You will have airplanes that cannot fly. You will have medicine if you say kill all the scholars of pharmacy. You will have medicine that stops working. Kill all the scholars in IT and computer science. Your phones will stop working. You cannot withdraw money from the banks. Scholars in every field. Scholars in every field are critical for the survival of society. You cannot say you will wait for school to educate you. When Allah has already given you a title, and he says, Inni ja'ilun fil ard khalifa, how can you be a khalifa of Allah and you don't care about knowledge of any field? Even if your subject is art, design, we want you. Why? Because even if you have the engineering capability and the IT capability to produce a phone, nobody will buy that phone if it, not, if it is not designed properly. If people didn't know how to write Allah and Muhammad, properly, you will not buy that lamp there. It's because somebody has beautiful calligraphy that we are buying that. It's because this sajada and prayer mat looks beautiful. We bought this one and you didn't buy a different one. It's because somebody knows how to design a beautiful minaret that we say, Masha Allah, beautiful mosque. And when as a mosque, or as a committee, you are, you are able to design your letterhead, or your website, or your business card, or your books. Or when you look at a copy of the Qur'an, and you look at how the design outside is done, then you find it beautiful. Allah is beautiful, and He loves beauty. What we want is ihsan, and itqan, excellence, professionalism, in anything we do. Our encouragement is for people to continue learning, get better. Why? Because if we don't have scholars in every field, and if we don't know who are the scholars, which means you have to reach a level of knowing who's a scholar and who's not a scholar. When you are sick, or your wife is sick, and you take her to the hospital, what's the problem? She is expecting a baby, alhamdulillah but she is feeling some pain in her stomach. Do you take her to the dentist? But he's a doctor. Do you take her to the dentist just because the dentist is called a doctor? <coughs> no. Do you take her to the psychiatrist because he's called a doctor? Do you take her to the university lecturer because he is also called doctor? No. You look for the specialist. Who's the specialist on this person's problem? You ask, is there a gynecologist or obstetrician? Somebody who this is his field of expertise. When problems get serious, you want the expert. When problems are not serious, you go to the GP, the general practitioner. And you tell him, this is my problem. He then says, go and see the gynecologist. Or he will say, for your little boy, go and see the pediatrician or your baby. And so, as an ummah, 
we need to know those scholars who are general practitioners and those scholars who are experts in hadith and experts in tafsir. Who is the muhaddith? Who is the mufassir? Who is the faqih? Who is the mujtahid? The one who studied usul al-fiqh, kawaid and maqasid. And if it is difficult to get one mujtahid because of the complex nature of society, you have a committee that have people who are grounded in usul and grounded in Quran and grounded in hadith and grounded in the society. They have studied the sociology. They know how the society works. And this group gets together and decides on the community. But these have to be a group of knowledgeable people. But with all the knowledge of the Prophet Allah told him, وَشَاوِرْهُمْ فِلْعَمْ Consult people in matters that relate to them. Ulama have to consult the community. Consult people who are experts in different fields. Fas'alu ahla dhikr in kuntu. Nobody knows everything. And so the Prophet consulted and the Sahaba consulted. Consult women in anything to do with women. Consult youth in anything to do with youth. Consult the politicians in anything to do with politics. Consult the, consult the economists in anything to do with economics. And the business people in anything to do with entrepreneurship. But we must continue learning. We must take knowledge as a compulsory preoccupation from cradle to the grave. You don't wait for a ta'aleem. Go and educate yourself. Alhamdulillah, today, gigabytes and megabytes are getting cheaper. Access to knowledge is becoming easier. But it is becoming very important for you to be able to distinguish between correct scholarship and ignorance that pretends it is scholarly. So even though we didn't all study medicine, but you know enough about health that when you go to a doctor or anyone and he tells you, take six tablets of antibiotics five times a day. You say six tablets? Antibiotics? Five times a day? Not a doctor. I'm not going to decide how much I will take. So what do you do? You go and consult another doctor. You don't blindly follow any scholar who says something and your fitra tells you this is problematic. You don't have the scholarship but he says something that you kind of, but this is going to create mafsada. This is going to harm society. You ask somebody else. We must think for ourselves. Be sensible. The ayat of Allah in the Quran and the ayat that he has created, fil afaq and the creation, are the qawmi yatafakkarun. The ulil albab. The qawmi yakilun. For people who will contemplate, think, be critical. Allah didn't give us the mind for no reason. Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali said, the relationship between aql, reasoning, and revelation, the Quran and Sunnah, is like the relationship between the eyes and light. If you say you are going to use your reasoning, and you are not going to use hidayah of revelation, you are like somebody who wants to move around with your eyes open, but it is dark, no light. And if you say you are going to use Quran and Sunnah, revelation, without the reasoning that Allah gave you, you are like somebody who wants to move around in broad daylight, but with your eyes closed. You are the same as the blind person. We live in times of serious extremism on the rise. But extremism only survives around ignorance. Extremism only survives where there are no scholars. Scholars of this community are not going to come from somewhere else. Please remember. In the next five years, ten years, when the generation over the next 10, 20, 30, 50 years 
has passed away, the next ulama of this community will come from this community. Why? Every community wants its ulamas to stay. Sayyidina Umar bin Khattab, when he became caliph, many of the top sahaba went to go and do da'wah to other places. He said, no, you stay, and you stay, and you stay. Why? I want knowledgeable people around me when I need advice. Everybody is looking for scholars now. It is your responsibility to start building, or should I say, continue building your own scholars. Alhamdulillah, you already have organizations. I understand one was called NUSO, another organization, uh, Bawaki. These are critical organizations for the future scholars, for the future doctors and the future nurses and the future first aid to lift our level. We live in a world that is very competitive. If a sheikh today is to become better and better and better, every day he decides he is going to read 10 pages, only 10. 10 pages of a book on a subject that is important. 10 pages a day. Is that too much? No. In one year, how many pages will this person have read if he reads only 10 pages a day? One year is about 365, let's just say 60, approximately, days. 10 pages a day means you have read 3,600 pages. How much is 3,600 pages? This is about how many pages? Approximately 600. This is 1,200. This here is 2,400. You need something as big as this to say one year of reading. If you can read this, this year, this amount, next year, even a student who has finished his master's degree will tell you, I have not read double of this. There's no certificate, but when you start talking, they will know you're a scholar. When you sit in a meeting and you start talking, normally this amount, this amount, as high as this, that's not a scholar. But if this is one year, or this is one year, and this is two years, and this is three, and this is four, and this is five, and this is six, and this is seven, and this is eight years, and this is nine years of reading, and this is 10 years of reading, even a PhD holder, three PhDs is not as much as you. But I can tell you what will happen if you read like that. Somebody will pack you out of here. You are too valuable to the Ummah for you to be left in one place in Nairobi or even one place in Kenya. Somebody wants you in a university somewhere else. You need to have passion and care to continue to remain. Knowledge is what has helped minority communities out of their challenges. There have been many minorities in the world. Christian minorities, Muslim minorities, Jewish minorities, minorities everywhere. The Muslims in South Africa are a minority. But for those who have gone to see the Muslims in South Africa, nobody looks down upon them. They are the doctors, they are the professors, they are the this, they are the that, they are the business community. You go to another community and you will find some Ismaili or Qadiani or Jews or Shia or whatever. Everywhere you see some minority and they decide to take knowledge and education seriously, 
within one generation they have changed their situation. <coughs> within your lifetime, you can change if you take knowledge seriously. Don't ever think it is too late for you to learn this in 20 years or 10 years or 5 years. If all you can learn in five years is like this, wallahi, your everything changes. Your behavior changes, your relationships change, your ability to help change, your network change. When you talk to some people who before will never listen to you, now they take you seriously. People who when you advise them, they don't take your advice. Now they will take your advice. They will not just take your advice. People in other countries want you to come and advise them. But it starts with something simple. <clears throat> something very simple. Read one page a day. Just one. Just one. <clears throat> and when it has become a habit and it has become easy, then do two pages. When that has become easy, then do three. The Prophet ﷺ said, the deeds most loved, most loved by Allah, are those done regularly, even if they are small. Small, so it's not difficult. But regularly, because then it becomes habit. Because if you can have more habit of reading, of learning, if you are going to be in a car 30 minutes from here to where you work, 30 minutes in a car, please don't waste it. Don't waste it on newspapers. Don't waste it on music. Your phones, turn your phone and that car or bus that you are going to be sitting in for the next 30 minutes, turn it into your personal private classroom. You will listen to lectures for 30 minutes going. You will listen to the same lecture 30 minutes coming back. And you take little notes. And tomorrow, do the same. If you don't like reading, start listening. If you are too distracted, watch. We have a lot of very good lectures by scholars online. But before you start going and reading, uh, wasting time, Ask people who know, what book do you advise? Why? Because Sheikh might have read a thousand books, but he will tell you 500 were a waste of time. If I had known this book before, I would not have read this one, this one, and this one. This book only confused me. This book clarified. So ask people who have read more to advise you on what to read and what to listen to. That doesn't stop you from doing your own exploration. To conclude, education is important, very important. But education does not guarantee peace. Some of the people who create problems in politics are very educated. Some of the most corrupt people in your community, in your society, go and look at their degrees. They are very educated. When Germany killed six million Jews, and Allah knows best the exact number and who else was killed, they were not ignorant. It's not that they didn't know engineering and medicine and all of this. <coughs> Shaitan is very knowledgeable, but he doesn't have guidance. It is never too late to learn. Never too late to learn. But remember, if you don't have taqwa to guide your knowledge, to give you direction, 
you are like somebody who has got a very strong calf, but you don't know the way to where you want to go. There's no use having a car with fuel, it's comfortable, you have a driver, and when you say, where are we going? I don't know. We keep saying, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. You have to always remember, ilayhi rajiun. You are going back to Allah. And you will answer. I will end with a story of a community who lived on an island. Some years in the past, the leader of that community arranged for all the dangerous animals. You know, when this community first came to this island, there were many dangerous animals. Snakes, lions, everything dangerous, they had them. When that leader first came, he got some of his top soldiers, let's catch all the dangerous animals and we move them to the other nearby island. Because there was another island not far away, you could see the other island. So all the dangerous animals were moved from this island to the other island. This king was very just, he was good, but he didn't have any children. And people were worried, when he dies, who will be the next king? So he told his people, when he reached a very advanced age, he was sick and he felt, I think my time has come. So he told them, I want you to listen carefully to the advice I want to give you. When I die, the next person that is going to be king, let him be king for only five years. And on the first day of the sixth year, carry him at night and take him to the island and drop him there and let the wild animals and everything deal with him. Everybody looked at this as a very strange way of succession. But they knew he was a very, very wise king. They never doubted his knowledge. They never doubted he cared. They said, what is the wisdom in this? He said, don't worry. Are you ready to do it? They said, no problem. <coughs> Time came and the king died. <coughs> and they got another. They asked the community, who is to be the next king? <coughs> Some people were not sure. Five years, and then they take you to the island. One guy said, I will be king. I want to be king. Anybody else? Me, me. He said, no problem, we'll go with first come first sir. So this man was made the king. During the first year, he decided to marry more wives. Second year, party, 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 party. Expand the palace. Make it more comfortable. New clothes, new food, and that's how year one, two, three, four, five went. On the first day of the sixth year, even before then, he started to get worried. Can we change the law? Sorry, no, you know the law. They made him, they came to him and said, we have to go to the island. He was shouting and screaming. They carried him, put him on the boat at night, went to the island, dropped him there, he was screaming, and then they heard the roar of animals. And then they heard silence. And you know what? <coughs> so they came back the next day. Okay, we want another king. Anybody ready to be king? I said, me. Anybody else? Nobody. Okay, you'll be king. You sure you want to be king? He said, I've had enough of life. If I only have five years to enjoy, I'll enjoy my five years. He did even more partying than the other one. <laughs> All he could think of was just dunya. 
he didn't want to eat the same food twice for the whole five years. Every meal, I should never eat this food again. He didn't want to wear the same clothes the next day. Every day, new clothes. Year one passed, four, five. At the end, on the first day of the sixth year, they packed him, screaming, shouting. They took him to the island at night. They heard the roar of animals and then silence. He was finished. Who wants to be king? Because they heard the story of what happened. And one teacher, who was well respected in the community, said, I want to be king. People said, are you stupid? Please, forget about this politics and forget about the kingship. Just stay with your students, we love you. He said, no, I want to be king. They begged him, begged him. He said, no, I want to be king. No problem. So they made him king. In the first year, he gathered hunters to go to that island. <laughs> <laughs> they went and made a nice big zoo. He didn't kill animals. No, only those had, had to be killed. Otherwise, he put them all in a zoo. The second year, he took top, top farmers and gave them good land. Beautiful market, nice housing. By the third year, schools. By the fourth year, people wanted to go and live on that island. Good street design. Everything beautiful, better than the first island. By the fifth year, he built a bridge between the mainland and the, ma the first island and the second island. And on the first day of the sixth year, security came and said, you know the rule, we need to take you to the other island. He said, no problem. They entered the boat, they went to the other side, and he said, why don't you come and have chai or tea at my house? Everybody in this world is like somebody who is living for a period of time. What made this last king successful is he thought long term. He thought long term. He knew where he was going. He knew in five years this is where he is going to end up. And he ensured that the long term objective guided his short term activities. We all agree, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. So if we know we are returning to Allah, then let us work for the Akhirah. But it is in dunya that you do the work for the Akhirah. Do things with justice. Show Rahmah. Build peace. Forgive others. Because as the Prophet ﷺ said, in number of hadith, it is how you treat others that will determine how Allah treats you. <coughs> Allah shows his rahmah to those who show rahmah on others. Allah forgives those who forgive others. Somebody asked the Prophet ﷺ, of all the things related to Allah that I should be afraid of, what is the number one I should be most afraid of? And the Prophet told him, be afraid of Allah's anger with you. Be afraid of Allah becoming angry with you. So he asked the Prophet ﷺ, and what do I do so that Allah doesn't get angry with me? Rasul ﷺ said, don't you get angry with people. Don't you get angry with people. We pray Allah continues to guide us on this path, Amen. in this world, in the hereafter. Amen. We pray he continues to guide and build us all and our scholars. Amen. And may those who will bring rahmah to this community Amen. be from among us. Amen. Just as the Prophet ﷺ was called Al-Amin by Jahiliyyah, let Jahiliyyah of today call us Al-Amin. Let the Jahiliyyah of today call us the 
trustworthy, those who are honest, those who are just, and those who are a rahmah to others. Thank you very much. Jazakumullah khairan wa ahlul da'wana. Alhamdulillah. 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 Alhamdulillah.